It's really good to be invited to speak to you today at um, this annual Warwick Economics Summit. I hope you're enjoying your Sunday and that uh, you had a good night last night and that's not getting in the way too much of the discussions today. I've been asked by the organisers to talk about um, the macro economy, the challenges we face and also um, the regulatory challenge as well. And I was thinking back uh, as I thought about this um, to when I was a graduate student, uh, I'm afraid over 20 years ago at Oxford but then at Harvard when um, we didn't have an independent Bank of England in the UK, when we had the Bank of England doing the regulation and when there was a real debate about these issues. I remember reading a very important paper by Larry Summers and Alberto Alessina, um, which was written at Harvard the time I was there, which was the case for bank independence. And what they said was, countries with an independent central bank tended to have low inflation, but didn't pay a cost in lost growth or lost employment. That was an important part of our thinking um, in opposition in the early 1990s. Also, the collapse of Britain's membership of the exchange rate mechanism, the need for a credible anchor in Britain, uh, where the government started with inflation targeting, but still some real questions of credibility. We came into government in 1997, made two big decisions. One, to make the Bank of England independent, to give them a clear symmetric target to deliver inflation, but to support growth. And secondly, to separate bank regulation um, uh, out of the Bank of England, still with a responsibility for overall stability in the financial system, but a new statutory independent regulator, the FSA. And uh, 16 years on, both those decisions have been in the spotlight in recent months and, uh, and years since that financial crisis. On the first, I think people would say pretty universally in Britain, bank independence has served us well. In the good times, we had growth and stability, but even after the financial crisis, where, to be honest, a credible central bank is able to cut interest rates harder, faster and more decisively than the political process would um, uh, 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 allow. There's been a debate in Britain in recent months about whether the inflation target is right, whether you should move to um, some kind of nominal income targeting instead, um, some kind of forward-looking signals. We've got a new governor coming from Canada, um, Mark Canada, uh, Carney, to take over at the Bank of England, and that's partly provoked this debate. I would say that um, this discussion about nominal income targeting is an important discussion, because at a time when growth is really low, and inflation is, is, is high, as we've seen in the last couple of years. It's very important the Bank of England has an eye on growth as well as on getting back to the inflation target. But frankly, a symmetric target plus an open letter system which allows the bank to explain why it's taking time to get inflation down again, that works pretty much like a nominal income targeting regime. I'm not sure the case for change has been made, and it could do real damage to stability and credibility if we got that wrong. But the real issue with British economic policy at the moment isn't monetary policy. We're in a liquidity trap. Interest rates are very low. It's not getting growth moving. The real problem is that um, uh, in these difficult times, overlaying on that financial crunch, a massive tightening of fiscal policy can be quite destabilising. And uh, we've seen the evidence from the IMF. The fiscal multipliers are more powerful at a time like this, and in these circumstances, as, uh, uh, as I've argued for two and a half years to George Osborne, attempting the fastest fiscal consolidation really in our history is destabilising to growth and confidence, can't be offset by looser monetary policy. It's not central bank independence which is a problem for growth in Britain, it's the fiscal policy regime which isn't working. The second area where there's been a debate is about financial regulation. Um, uh, our Chancellor George Osborne in opposition tried to argue that the flaw in British regulation was separating off regulation from the Bank of England, giving it to the FSA. And he's unified them back together in law uh, within the Bank of England. Frankly, um, countries all around the world had this financial crisis. Countries which had a unified central bank regulator, Twin Peaks uh, separated regulators, they all suffered the same problem. It was fundamentally failure to spot the problem, to regulate toughly enough, and in bank culture. That was true in all these countries. And uh, the crisis was missed by the Treasury and the FSA and the Bank of England in 2005, 6 uh, and 7. I'm not convinced that structural change is really the key. The real key is, is the regulation tough enough and is the culture of banks changing? On tougher regulation, the Vixers Commission here in Britain has regulated much tougher standards. 
We're pressing the government not to water them down. There'll be legislation in Parliament in the coming weeks. Getting regulation right for the future is very important. But the real issue is bank culture. The banks have got to change. They've got to move away to, from that short-termist, sales-driven culture. That's something which um, some argue is caused by investment banking, contaminating retail banking, although there were, uh, there were banks which got into real trouble which weren't integrated banks. Fundamentally, um, this is something we're going to continue to look at, but bank culture has got to change. It's something government's got to push and lead. The legislation can help, but the banks have got to lead that change. It's essential for lending, uh, for fairness and for the future of our economy and we'll be keeping that under close review as you will today and in future Warwick uh, summits. This issue of regulation is not going to go away, something you'll continue to discuss, but the case of central bank independence, I think it's still pretty strong.